Good afternoon to you all. My name is Rebecca Mignot-Madavi. I'm researcher in international law at the Asser Institute in the human dignity and human security strand. Um, welcome to the Asser Institute virtually and to this event. Today's lecture is organized in the context of HILAC, which stands for the Hague Initiative for Law and Armed Conflicts. The HILAC lecture series has been organized since 2005 uh, by the Asser Institute, but not only, uh, always in cooperation with the Amsterdam Center for International Law and the Netherlands Red Cross. And in addition to uh, the HILAC uh, partners, this event is co-organized uh, by the IHCL platform, which is a cooperation network among uh, universities in Belgium and in the Netherlands uh, to uh, foster IHL and ICL research. Today's lecture will be on military necessity and the law of war, and we are absolutely delighted to have with us an excellent speaker and, and thinker as well, who I will now introduce to you. Uh, and I should stress that what follows is just a brief uh, selection of Nobuo's impressive background. So my apologies in advance. Um, so Nobuo Hayashi is an associate senior lecturer at the Center for International and Operational Law at the Swedish Defense University. He also holds visiting uh, professorships at the UN mandated University for Peace in Costa Rica. Um, uh, also at the UN Interregional Crime and Justice Research Institute in Italy. Uh, Nobuo specializes, as is very clear with the focus of this, um, of this highlight lecture, on uh, international humanitarian law, but not only, uh, also in international criminal law, use at bellum and international weapons law. He has uh, 20 years of experience in these area, not only teaching, but also training professionals, uh, practicing. He was, uh, for example, working at the office of the prosecutor um, uh, at the International Crib Criminal Tribunal for the former yeah. Yugoslavia. Uh, Nobuo's work uh, has been quite influential, uh, cited in international uh, war crime trials and uh, diplomatic negotiations, and I'm and I'm pretty sure that his latest uh, work, his latest monograph, will be as influential as his former work. Um, uh, it's on military necessity, the art, morality, and the law of war, and it was published this year uh, by Cambridge University Press. Uh, thank you again, Nobuo. Uh, welcome. Thank you for making time in your in your busy schedule. Um, just a, a few words before giving you the floor uh, on the format. So the lecture will last for about uh, 40 minutes, after which we will proceed with a Q&A session. Uh, feel free to send already in the chat box your, your questions uh, to, to Nobuo. Uh, I will then um, make sure that I ask as many of them as possible uh, for the Q&A session, which will last for about 20 to 30 minutes. I uh, now uh, spoken of, uh, Nobuo, congratulations again on your book and you have the floor. Thank you, Rebecca, uh, for that uh, flattering, flattering introduction. Uh, and good afternoon to everybody. Well, at least for those who are in some parts of Europe, good afternoon. And for those in other parts of the world, either good morning or good evening. Um, and thank you for uh, coming to this uh, uh, lecture. As Rebecca said, um, uh, I will be speaking about military necessity and the law of armed conflict. The content of this lecture stems from the book that I published this year. But obviously it's not going to be a full expose of the book. Rather, it would be a sort of a highlight of the main, uh, let's say arguments and findings of, uh, of the book. And uh, I uh, look forward to receiving uh, questions and comments uh, since the book is still relatively fresh off the print. Now, I propose to proceed uh, uh, with an introduction, first of all, and then uh, three substantive, let's say, takeaways uh, out of uh, my thinking about military necessity and law. Act. The first major takeaway is military necessity as normative indifference. I'll explain to you, obviously, what that means. And the second takeaway is the 
three specific contexts in which our discussion about military necessity becomes relevant. The key point being that these contexts, distinct contexts, tend to get lost when we discuss military necessity. So it's important for us to keep them in mind when, engaged, when you engage in this discussion. And thirdly, uh, by way of really sort of recapitulating uh, the main points that I would raise, what military necessity does not do, contrary to the popular expectations of the notion. And if we have enough time, I would like to discuss very briefly uh, some of the, what I would call offshoots coming out of this, this research, which goes beyond, which go beyond uh, thinking about military necessity. In fact, they go into humanity and chivalry uh, more than military necessity, but uh, that's subject to the availability of time. So let us begin by uh, uh, sharing some introductory thoughts I have about military necessity. So my research on this topic has been driven by two major research questions. One, when people say that international humanitarian law or the law of armed conflict accounts for military necessity, because it is uh, the product of a uh, compromise stuck between military necessity and humanity and so on. You, 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 would have, you would have heard of all these things about how it is the product of compromise between competing interests. And the result of that is to say that LOAC therefore accounts for military necessity. But what does that really mean when we say it? That was the... Uh, first of the two research questions that have shaped my research. The second question is, okay, to what normative consequences does LOAC accounting for military necessity give rise? Once we have understood what accounting for military necessity really means, what consequences do they give rise to? So these are the two major research questions that have informed my thinking about the concept. Now, as I went about thinking about military necessity and LOAC, uh, there emerged three major aims or purposes of why I wanted to do this research. The first aim of my research is really to reaffirm uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with this kind of defunct, debunked uh, German doctrine called Kriegsraison. I really wanted to reaffirm the invalidity of this doctrine because there are indications in contemporary literature that purport to sort of resurrect Kriegsraison through the back door. And I really wanted to confront that tendency. The second aim I had, or I found myself pursuing, I should say, is to also uh, address some sort of an overreaction to a critique's raison. So it's one thing for us to invalidate or reaffirm the invalidity of critique's raison, but you can actually, in fact, do too much of it such that you end up embracing what I would call counter Kriegs raison. And counter Kriegs raison is invalid in my opinion for the very same reason why Kriegs raison is invalid. Finally, I found myself pursuing uh, some major leading commentators in the field of LOAC uh, who appear to espouse some very problematic notions about the interplay between humanity and military necessity. Uh, what I call the inevitable conflict thesis. The idea is embraced by this thesis is that neither military necessity 
nor humanity may be invoked de novo as justifications for deviating from unqualified rules of law. We know that military necessity cannot be invoked when a law rule says you may not do it under any circumstances. Now, the people who espouse what I call the in inevitable conflict thesis seem to argue that the same exclusion applies to humanity. So no amount of humanity pleas would justify you deviating from unqualified rules of law. I found that a bit problematic, but I had difficulty formulating precisely why it is that it's problematic. I hope to have found a solution to that difficulty, and I wish to be able to share that with you this afternoon. So these are the three major aims coming out of my research. Now, a brief uh, uh, observation on uh, my methodology. In a nutshell, I have applied um, a school of jurisprudential thought called uh, neo harshian uh, inclusive positivism. For those who are familiar with uh, uh, jurisprudence as a, as, a, as a scholarly field, you would know what it is. Um, so it's a species of positivism, but it's a, I, cons I consider inclusive positivism to be uh, sufficiently flexible and uh, dynamic in its application to be useful when we look at LOAC and other related disciplines of international law. I know that uh, positivism has, a, has come under some sort of uh, pressure from uh, critics, uh, criti the, uh, uh, critics of, this of this doctrine. And I'm not here to, let's say, defend positivism against such critics, this afternoon at least. I merely wish to show you how, if you carefully apply tenets of inclusive positivism, of a neo harshian uh, character, I think you will be surprised to see how uh, instructive that is. So, that being said, let me move on to uh, the first substantive item that I identified a few minutes ago, and that is military necessity as normative indifference. What does that mean? By this, I mean that military necessity neither obligates, nor prohibits, nor restricts anything. Rather, it merely and therefore indifferently permits. That, in essence, is what I assert uh, as the uh, meaning, meaning of military necessity, at least within the field of international humanitarian. And what follows from this is that because military necessity is normatively indifferent, that is, it doesn't prohibit, doesn't obligate anything. It is never in conflict with imperatives of humanity and chivalry. On the contrary, whatever military necessity permits is open to, uh, is always in joint satisfaction with the imperatives of humanity and, and chivalry. In other words, the belligerent always has the option to act in accordance with military necessity and humanity or chivalry, always. The belligerent has the option to do that. There are circumstances when uh, the belligerent's choice uh, amounts to the, the absence of joint satisfaction between such cons considerations like military necessity, humanity, and chivalry, but that's also a choice that the belligerent makes. 
My, what's important to me is to highlight how the religion always has, always has the, the option to act in a manner that is jointly satisfactory to military necessity and humanity. And that is possible because military necessity is normatively indifferent. And what I have been calling joint satisfaction is basically what refutes the inevitable conflict thesis. Now, maybe I should say a few more words about what all these things mean. Ultimately, international humanitarian law does not make it its business to save incompetent belligerents from themselves. If a warring party decides to make mistakes, strategic, operational, tactical, and uh, misses uh, military opportunities to be successful in their campaigns, that religion has only itself to blame for that. International humanitarian law is not concerned with making sure that warring parties fight well or fight competently vis-a-vis -vis each other. If with, of course, uh, limitations in mind, one might compare IHL on the one hand and uh, some sort of uh, regulatory, reg regulatory regimes uh, applicable to dangerous interpersonal sports like boxing, I might be able to highlight, uh, illustrate what I mean by this. So the boxing rules are not really concerned about um, making it a duty on the part of a boxer to win, nor it is concerned with uh, preventing a boxer from losing a match or uh, uh, losing points. If a boxer decides to fight poorly, for example, for whatever reason, then the rules are simply not there to protect him or prohibit him from doing it. So who wins or whether any party wishes to do well so that it would win is not of concern to the rules of such sports. Similarly, IHL is not there to, uh, uh, to make it difficult for the belligerents to fight poorly. Now, we may need, to, we, it is necessary for us to add some nuance to this. Pursuing what's militarily necessary in war is of some uh, significance to IHL lawmakers. And that is because IHL lawmakers, in other words, states through the right rules of IHL, are themselves potential or actual belligerents. So of course, they, do, they do, wouldn't want IHL rules to be too cumbersome and too limiting on their ability to wage wars, should they ever have to do it. So allowing space, normative space for successful military operations is of some concern, some significance to IHL lawmakers, but it's not peremptory because there are other considerations that may, let's say, take precedence over such uh, military necessity considerations like the imperative requirements of humanity. But what is not true is that IHL being sensitive to military disutilities per se. Military disutilities are not regulated per se by IHL. So in this way, IHL is not uh, an exclu exclusively utilitarian uh, regime. Let's suppose you are fighting a just war from the USAP Bellum point of view. Uh, 
So whatever is necessary to win that just war that you're fighting is of some concern to IHO lawmakers, clear. But if you take utilitarianism at its face value, you have to accept that whatever is detrimental to the just war that you're fighting, whatever doesn't help you win the just war is in fact illegitimate and suitable for prohibition and condemnation and so on. That is the flip side of utilitarianism. IHO does not do that. If you waste your resources, if you, for example, train spies and informants poorly, so that when you send them to enemy fields and they fail to collect the intelligence you need, you are doing your job poorly. In other words, you are acting contrary to what military necessity would require you to do in order to win the war. But IHL is not going to prohibit you from training spies poorly. If you do that, you have only yourself to blame for it. So that is what's meant by normative indifference. Now, if you take that, if you accept military necessity being normatively indifferent, how would that lead to what I call joint satisfaction with humanity and chivalry? So here we need to engage a little bit in um, uh, uh, the conflict of norms discussions. When do conflicts, when do norms conflict with each other? Traditionally, it was the case. It was seen to be the case that if you have a duty to do something, and if you have a counter duty to refrain from doing something, there you have a conflict. But there would not be a conflict if you have a duty to do something on the one hand, and on the other hand, you have a counter liberty not to do it, to refrain from doing it. A good example uh, suggested by a philosopher, uh, the Finnish philosopher called Georg von, uh, von Reich, is that let's imagine a train, a carriage. If you have a non-smoking carriage, then you are duty bound not to smoke. And there is no counter liberty of smoking in that carriage. If you have a smoking carriage, however, you may choose to smoke, but you may also choose not to smoke. So there is no, there is a normative indifference in that carriage. So if you have on the one hand a duty to do something, but on the other hand, a liberty to refrain from doing that same thing, there is no conflict. That was the traditional view on the matter. Nowadays, I think the scholarly opinion is moving in a direction where you, you nevertheless have a known conflict where you have one duty to do something, which prevents you from exercise, exercising an established right to, to refrain from it. Or if you have a right to do something, but if, you, if you're faced with a counter, counter duty to refrain from doing that thing, then we tend to think that there is a, a conflict as well. Now, my take on this when it comes to humanity and military necessity is that There would be a conflict of this frustrating sort if the law of armed conflict had two valid rules that posited positive rules, one uh, obligating, uh, some, uh, prohibiting something, and the other rule, uh, because, okay, prohibiting something because it's inhumane, let's say, so torture. On the other hand, uh, a rule that expressly, expressly authorizes torture if it's militarily necessary, on the other hand. 
then if you have two valid rules like that under IHL, then there would be a conflict because you, you are given the right to torture where militarily necessary. That's a valid rule. And on the other hand, you have a, a, a tort, an absolute prohibition against torture on account of its inhumaneness. So you have a conflict. But we are not talking about this kind of two valid rules in conflict with each other. What we are now looking at is how IHO lawmakers look at what military necessity would indifferently permit on the one hand, and on the other hand, what humanity, for example, would demand or condemn on the, then you as a lawmaker hope to come up with one final valid rule that resolves the matter one way or the other. So we are not really talking about an in irresolvable non-conflicts as we understand them today. So ultimately, if you are permitted to do something, if military necessity leaves you at liberty to do something, but also to refrain from doing some, the same thing on the, on the one hand. On the other hand, military, uh, humanity telling you, you shall not do that, the same thing. So on the one hand, you have the prohibition against doing something. On the other hand, you have a normatively indifferent uh, uh, military necessity leaving you at liberty to do whatever you want. Then by choosing to act as directed by humanity, you always satisfy military necessity. No matter how you do it, you, as long as you behave as directed by humanity, you ipso facto also satisfy military necessities, normative indifference. In other words, joint satisfaction is always possible. If the belligerent chooses to act as directed by humanity, you jointly satisfy humanity and military necessity. That is what is at stake in IHO lawmaking. Let us move on to the three contexts, distinct contexts in which military necessity appears. They are what I call the material context of uh, war fighting. That is a matter of um, uh, rational or effective fighting, devoid of any moral or ethical considerations. Do you get your job done or not? That's basically the question. The second context is uh, the normative context of IHO lawmaking. And the third context is the juridical context of positive IHL. These contexts each address themselves to different uh, audiences, shall we say. The first context of materiality or operational reality, if you will, address addresses itself to uh, commanders, military planners, or military historians who are concerned about the successful campaigns or assessing how successful the campaign was. In this context, military necessity embodies a twofold tourism. One, it is in the strategic self interest of each belligerent to pursue military necessities and avoid military non necessities. If you want to win the war, that's what's in your interest to do. The truism is twofold. And the second fold is that, but it is, uh, it is against the strategic self-interest of each belligerent to let go of military necessities or to encumber itself with military non-necessities, that is wasteful fighting and blunders and mistakes and so on. Uh, now, again, if you want to win the war, uh, it's not in your interest to just send incompetent generals who would waste the lives of young soldiers for no military gain, for example. But that's all a matter of rational and effective war fighting. 
There is nothing more, nothing less to it. The second context of lawmaking, now the, cons the audiences, in the primary audience uh, of this context are those diplomats and delegates who come to places like Geneva and The Hague and elsewhere to write IHL treaties, or more metaphorically, those state actors who through their uh, behavior participate in the formation of customary IHL. Here, military necessity is a weighty but non-peremptory lawmaking reason. The lawmaking reason that encourages the lawmakers to leave belligerents at liberty to pursue military necessities and avoid military non-necessities, but also to forego military necessities and to encumber themselves with non-necessities if, so, if they so wish. In other words, to preserve the greatest uh, scope of behavioral liberty. Now, when, you, when lawmakers uh, take military necessity into consideration understood this way and look at humanity, which may be more morally engaged, such as, for example, shall not harm, you shall not kill POWs, or you shall not uh, destroy property in occupied territories. And then the lawmakers would decide how to write the final rules. In the case of uh, the humanitarian imperative against killing POWs, that humanitarian imperative combined with the, the normatively indifferent military necessity leads to the unqualified prohibition against killing POWs. That is what the lawmakers decide to, to legislate. When it comes to the, the, pro, the destruction of property in occupied territories, as some of you know, the lawmakers decided to make the prohibition against destroying property in occupied territory a principal obligation, but subject to military necessity exceptions. So that is a choice that the lawmaker has made to permit military necessity pleas as an exception. In the third context of juridical uh, context, the primary addressees of this context are those who are called upon to uh, assess the lawfulness of belligerent action on the ground, whether they be human rights monitors, prosecutors, defense lawyers, judges, fact finders, you name them. But here, the context is quite different from the first two, because what you have is IHO rules that have been posited in, an, in their final form by the lawmaker, and then you apply those rules to what happens on the ground. Here, there are three ways in which military necessity manifests itself uh, in this juridical context. One is perhaps somewhat oddly through exclusions. So when final, final rules of IHL as they are written do not contain any military necessity exceptions, that means that the lawmakers have decided to exclude military necessity pleas as a ground to justify deviations from those rules. So military necessity becomes relevant in a sense that it is not available as a plea. And there are many rules of this nature. The second way in which military necessity manifests itself in this juridical context of positive, positive IHL is as express 
uh, the exceptional clauses. So the property destruction uh, provisions in occupied territories contain express military necessity exceptions. The destruction of cultural property, also the culture, the law of, on the protection of cultural property has a lot of military necessity exceptional clauses attached to many of its, uh, its rules too. So the lawmakers have decided to allow military necessity pleas to be a modifier of the rule itself. And then the third way in which military necessity manifests itself in this positive context, the juridical context, is as a negative element of some war crimes and crimes against humanity that are built substantively on those rules of IHL that contain military necessity exceptions, as I said earlier. So if the violation of such a rule were to con constitute a war crime, the absence of justifying circumstances would itself be an element of that crime. That seems logical enough. So if destroying property in occupied territories is a war crime, can constitute a war crime, then because the rule itself contains military necessity exceptions, it would only constitute war crimes if the destruction occurs without military necessity. So that's the last way in which military necessity appears in this juridical context of positive IHL or positive ICL in this case. So having gone through uh, the major uh, characteristics of military necessity in this way, I wish to uh, note the three things that military necessity does not do. First, military necessity does not tell the belligerents what to do. As I said, all that military necessity does is to say that, well, if you want to win the war, if you mean, if you are serious about winning the war, then it would be in your interest to pursue military necessity and avoid non-necessities. But what can I say? If you choose to fight poorly and lose the war, well, that's your prerogative too. Second, military necessity does not prompt IHL lawmakers to obligate military necessities or prohibit military non-necessities. IHL is fundamentally indifferent to military non-necessities as a, a disutility. It is left to be suffered by the incompetent belligerents themselves. Lastly, military necessity does not resurrect Kriegsraison. Now, maybe it's a good moment for me to explain to you briefly what Kriegsraison says and why it is still dead, as it should be. Kriegsraison, in a nutshell, is a doctrine that says that if something is militarily sufficiently important, then that sufficient importance renders, overrides any positive rules of IHL and renders such rules inoperative. In other words, if it's so important for you to do something in order to win the war, then nothing in IHL will prohibit it. Notwithstanding some rules that purport to prohibit it, they don't because you, it's, it's of sufficient military necessity. So, this doctrine was, uh, let's say, considered and thoroughly discredited at Nuremberg and has since been considered uh, 
debunked as a, as a, as a, as a doctrine. And you can imagine how uh, dangerous a doctrine like that would be. So if you can claim that doing X is militarily necessary, and I say that basically means I can ignore all contradictory rules of IHF and keep uh, render my conduct lawful, all things considered, you are basically acting as uh, you are revising IHL as you go. But um, the, if you accept the three contextualities, that is the material, normative, and juridical, then the lawmaking phase already happened. And you, metaphorically speaking, at least as the state, took part in that rule, rule writing exercise. So it's not up to you to uh, assume the role of a reviser spontaneous reviser of the rule that you wrote yourself. And that remains true today, as it did when Kriegsraison was alleged at Nuremberg and before in the 19th century Germany, for example. And nothing in my research on military necessity uh, contradicts this finding. Milit uh, the uh, Kriegsraison remains invalid. But what's interesting is that so Kriegs raison says that whatever is militarily necessary becomes lawful. That's the nutshell, the Kriegs raison in a nutshell. What I call counter Kriegs raison says, whatever is militarily unnecessary becomes unlawful, ipso facto. And this I have a problem with because as I said, IHL is fundamentally indifferent to disutilities. It doesn't prohibit uh, acts that are lacking in necessity per se. We do have rules of IHO that happen to prohibit acts that are unnecessary, but the lack of necessity is not the reason for their prohibition. It is always some sort of evil that the act entails. That is what is the basis of their prohibition. Let's, for example, take torture. Uh, torture, some, okay, torture is not a good, good example. Property destruction. Property destruction is, let's say, inhumane. Let's agree that it is inhumane. Now, but you can have uh, this property destruction that is militarily necessary happens to be militarily necessary, and property destruction that happens to be militarily unnecessary. We know that the Fourth Geneva Convention prohibits the second type of property destruction, property destruction that happens to be militarily unnecessary. What happens if the, de what changes if property destruction moves from being militarily necessary to being militarily unnecessary? the evilness entailed by the property destruction remains the same. Move, moving from one to the next basically lifts the exceptionally permissible character of this act on account of military necessity. So being militarily unnecessary simply means that that ground is now gone. So what's left is evil or inhumanity. And it is that inhumanity that is the reason for prohibiting property destruction, not the lack of necessity. The lack of necessity simply lifts the lid so that the principal rule now prohibits it without be, because the act ceases to be accepted from the principal rule. So it never, military necessity is, non-necessity is never the reason alone for a rules prohibition, or for an act's prohibition under IHL. Counter Kriegs raison is erroneous because it asserts that the lack of necessity per se renders an act unlawful. Now, I have spoken a little more than I intended, so uh, let us um, uh, uh, defer the 
extra findings that I uh, thought I might offer you uh, from my research for another occasion. And perhaps uh, uh, Rebecca can open the floor for discussion. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Nabu, for this very interesting uh, lecture. And uh, I'm sure also, or I hope that the Q&A will allow you to delve a little bit more into the, the remaining findings that you wanted to share with us. Um, so let me check into the chat. So um, we have um, a few questions. I will try to uh, pack them together with regards to the, to, to the 15 or let's say 20 minutes that we have ahead of us. Um, so, uh, one question is, it seems that military necessity is an excuse for warring parties to do inhumane activity. Will it be possible for an existing statute to limit or restrict this necessi necessity? This is one uh, first question. Sure, I, maybe I will uh, give you a few uh, all together and then you will decide uh, how best to address them. Um, another question uh, that I got is, uh, challenging you on the norm conflict um, uh, issue and having side by sides on the one hand the idea of prohibition uh, to kill civilians so the the principle of distinction and on the other hand the idea that sometimes collateral damages are acceptable uh, if proportionate to the military advantage so in that can in in that case the person asks um, if we are not according to you in a norm conflict situation um, where military necessity is satisfied in the second scenario, um, but humanity not satisfied. And, and the person goes a little bit further asking uh, um, if according to one view of humanity, you wouldn't agree that uh, we could say that all civilian harm is in any case uh, lacking humanity and that therefore uh, we are constantly looking for compromise um, uh, with these uh, different rules of IHO, um, leaving us ultimately with only one option, uh, having a spectrum of more or less humane wars or military operations along the way. Maybe I will leave you with these first two questions and uh, I will get back with more afterwards. Well, thank you, Rebecca, for those two, two questions. Uh, uh, let's start with the, the military necessity being used as an excuse. I understand the question to use the expression excuse in a colloquial way, not excuse in the criminal law defense uh, sense, I take it. Yes, of course, um, uh, belligerents left and right would invoke military necessity in order to describe what they do. So killing in the, during the Napoleonic War, as his army is advanced towards Moscow, in the winter, with the winter approaching, Napoleon's generals decided to kill thousands and thousands of Russian prisoners, POWs, on account of military necessity. The reason was that keeping those prisoners safe and fed and looked after would slow down the advances and they know that the winter is coming so you cannot allow your advancing army to slow down. And there is not uh, enough logistical infrastructure to transfer thousands of Russian POWs into the rear area where they may be detained and so on. So military necessity dictated that they, would be, they should be killed. Yes, so you can say that military necessity leaves us with no option but to do this or to do that. But so what? It's one thing for a belligerent to describe its behavior by reference to military necessity. Look, I was, I wanted to get my mother's life insurance. That's why I killed my mother. Well, that may explain your behavior, but that has no bearing on whether you killing your mother is law in accordance with the law or contrary to the law. So when it comes to military necessity being used as excuses for uh, unpleasant behavior by the belligerent, yes, that happens as a matter of fact, but that has nothing to do with what IHL or LOAC uh, 
how IHO look approaches military necessity as a concept, or how it deals with military necessity as a concept. The second question, whether uh, the way LOAC treats collateral damage as a spectrum uh, suggests some sort of a comprom compromise being struck and whether there be some sort of a known conflict nevertheless, that if I understood the question correctly. I think we may be uh, speaking past each other here. When we look at the final rule, the rule that is actually written in IHL, the, uh, the IHL rule regarding proportionality is uh, one very good example of how the lawmakers uh, decide to leave the uh, joint satisfaction indeterminate between uh, military necessity and humanity. So, as I said, the belligerent always has the option to act in accordance with humanity and therefore jointly in a joint satisfaction with military necessity. Targeting civilians is what military necessity indifferently permits. But military necessity also indifferently permits the belligerents to refrain from targeting civilians. That's what, what it means for military necessity to be normatively indifferent. It doesn't tell you one way or the other what you should do. Faced with that indifference on the one hand and what humanity would clearly demand, that is you, sh you ought not to target civilians. I think there is no major controversy to say that humanity would condemn target the civilian targeting and that not targeting civilian is what humanity demands. So joint satisfaction here takes the shape of not targeting civilians. If a belligerent decides, you know, I can see that there's a civilian there, I could target him, but I choose not to for whatever reason, then you just con behaved in a jointly satisfactory manner. What does the law say? What, what, did the law, what would the lawmakers do when confronted with such situations? The law currently says that you shall, you, you are left permitted to, uh, I have to be careful here. You have to, the law indifferently permits you to let some civilians die. Incidentally, at least. But the incidental causing of civilian death is capped at proportion, not being excessive in relation to the concrete and definite military advantage, uh, direct military advantage anticipated. So from beyond that no, uh, excessiveness threshold, there is a prohibition. So, you have no longer, you are no longer left permitted to cause such civilian damage, although that may be consistent with one indifferent aspect of military, military necessity. So you, there, there, you have, you have no choice according to the law, but to choose to behave in a jointly satisfactory way. In other words, by not causing excessive civilian collateral damage. The interesting thing about this is that that moment when uh, military necessities in different permission is what the law allows you to do, ceases, and the mandatory joint satisfaction begins in the shape of refraining from causing excessive civilian damage. That line is left indeterminate because all that the law says is it shall not be excessive. But we all know how unhelpful such language is because the, var the variables are different, 
uh, they are basically incommensurable with each other. So the lawmaker has basically dropped the ball. We don't know how to draw the line. So the you, the addressees, the belligerents, you have to decide where the line is. And the judges and others may come back to you and tell you that you did wrong. But the lawmakers decided not to come up with that line themselves. That's how I see the interplay between military necessity and humanity. And there still, there is no norm conflict because we're talking about how the lawmakers take into consideration humanitarian imperatives on the one hand and military necessity uh, indifference on the other hand and write one rule. Yeah, I, I think that's very helpful also to see how a Hartian can actually accept the level, a certain level of indeterminacy in the law. And I, I think that's a very accurate reading of, of Hart as well. So it's nice to, to hear it in that context. Uh, we have a, um, a question from Sean. Uh, who says, thank you, Nobuo, for your illuminating and patient explanations. You have a lot of comments of that kind. I will send them to you afterwards. I will get uh, straight to the question. So uh, in your book, uh, you consider the interesting uh, scenario of an act that lacks military necessity, but is otherwise lawful under the law of armed conflict. That is no positive rule of, uh, of uh, the, the law of armed conflict expressly prohibits this unnecessary act. We have touched upon this already. Yep. So... Um, I wonder whether you might expand um, on um, the juridical function of military necessity. So if we could expand a little bit on this, does it have a binding force as a standalone a rule of conduct? Uh, if you can say a little bit more about this. Another question. Um, so uh, thank you for this uh, presentation of your book, uh, which for us practitioners from Basile de B uh, uh, Bedji, um, um, for us practitioners of international relations should be a book to read. I now understand this concept of military necessity. Military necessity is the concept of legally using only that kind and degree of force that is required to overpower the enemy. I understand that well, but my question is, what do you think of the anti-terrorist action launched by the Kiev government against part of its dissident population in the Donbass? I want to talk about the legality that the international community grants to the action of Kiev. When, under what conditions, is military necessity legal with regard to IHL? <laughs> okay. I will leave you to, to these uh, two questions first. Uh, we, ha we have several questions referring to uh, concrete uh, cases and scenarios. This is why I wanted to pick one. Yes. Okay. Um, let's deal with the uh, Ukrainian question first. One thought that springs to mind as I listen to, sprang to mind as I listen to the question is I'm not sure if there is a, a there are three things that seem to be kind of uh, coalescing together in that question. One is anti-terror. Uh, second is use of Berlin. And third is using Berlin. So it, it seems to be a lot a com com sort of compressed into that question. And that makes it difficult to address, uh, this question difficult to address uh, briefly. There, so I, 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 I hope uh, you forgive me uh, by kind of dealing with it in a, a summary fashion when it comes to the first two areas of international law. First of all, anti-terror, the an law of uh, anti-terror law, shall we say, my research on military necessity is limited to law act. And whatever a, a, a government, the sitting government chooses to do to counter terror uh, domestically or internationally is really not uh, properly within the scope of my military necessity research. Similarly, you said Bellum I have in my book identified several points where Yusat Belen and Yusin Belo kind of meet each other and where military necessity understood in a more sort of a conceptually philosophical way might become an interesting uh, connecting notion. But as far as 
positive rules of IHL are concerned, USAT Bilum has nothing to do with whether something is militarily necessary within the meaning of IHL. So USAT Bilum, I would just leave out uh, from this discussion for simplicity's sake, if not, if not for nothing else. Now, whether what the Kiev government does in the rebel-held area as a matter of use in Belo, that is LOAC, that's all up to IHL NIACs, of course, the applicable rules of IHL NIACs, if NIAC is what we have in Eastern Ukraine. Some people might say that the Russian involvement has elevated it to an international conflict and so on, but whatever the classification, you have a finite set of rules of IHL, either IHL IAC or IHL NIAC, and each of these bodies of law has rules that are written with or without military necessity exceptions in them. So where you do have a rule with military necessity exceptions written in it, discussions of military necessity become relevant. But if the rule you have at hand does not contain military necessity exceptions, military necessity is not a relevant concept anymore. Again, once again, uh, uh, for example, uh, tar uh, uh, injuring or killing a person placed hors de combat, let's say that's a rule of IHL that applies to IACs and NIACs alike. Whether it may be militarily necessary to injure a person hors de combat is, uh, it's, a, it's a, an incoherent question because the rule prohibiting the ill treatment, Ill treatment of persons placed all the combat is absolute. No amount of military necessity plea will change that rule. So that's as far as, that's what I can say as far as the Ukraine situation is concerned from an IHL point of view. Now going back to the first question, what was the first question again? So basically what, what uh, does, does it tell us, your, your, your claim, what does it tell us about the juridical function that military necessity can play? And maybe uh, uh, putting another question together with it. So what does it tell us about this, the, the peculiarity of this rule, of this, type of, of this type of principle with comparison with other rules of IHL? Well, when it comes to military necessity, so if we limit ourselves to what's written, here comes my very positivist <laughs> part. If we take what's written as IHL at face value, the only place where military necessity becomes relevant is if a rule talks about military necessity expressed. Again, property destruction is a, is a, is a typical rule that allows military, except, military necessity exceptions. There are some other rules, uh, such as uh, uh, forcibly removing uh, persons from occupied territory for imperative military reasons, albeit only for a temporary period of time. No permanent displacement is justifiable on account of military necessity, but temporary forcible uh, displacement may be. But here too, we have military necessity written into the rule. So that's one way in which military necessity as a notion becomes relevant in relation to other rules of IHL. And part of my book deals with the, what the requ requirements of military necessity exceptions are. So if you have a rule that says you shall not do X, but unless militarily necessary, how do we interpret the military necessity exception? There is a sufficient amount of jurisprudence that's caseful and scholarly work to allow us to come up with the content of this exception. I identify four cumulative requirements. One, the measure that you take in the name of military necessity would have to be aimed at achieving some military purpose. If it's not for military purpose, military necessity, please make no sense. Or you are ineligible to rely on military necessity uh, as, as an exception. Second, 
the measure you take would have to be considered required in order to achieve the aim, the military purpose that you just identified. Otherwise, your claim of military necessity would fail. And this measure having to be considered required to, acquire, to achieve the, the military purpose has three components. One, there has to be some sort of a reasonable link between the measure you take and the purpose you pursue. If there is no reasonable link between what you do and what you claim to want to achieve, then your claim fails. Second, amongst the measures that are reasonably available to you, which would have the reasonable prospects of allowing you to achieve the aim that you identified, you must choose the measure that is least injurious. That's the second condition for the measure to be considered required. Third, even if you choose the least injurious, reasonably available measure in view of the pur military purpose you pursue, the benefit you seek to gain from it would have to be in some sort of proportion to the harm that would be occasioned by the measure you take. So there is a crude proportionality-ish test involved in here. Third, the purpose itself would otherwise have to be lawful according to IHL. And fourthly, the measure itself would have to be otherwise lawful according to IHL. So when you fulfill these four cumulative requirements, you can invoke the military necessity exception as a, in, a, in order to justify your conduct if the rule itself contains military necessity exceptions. So there, there is a sizable body of scholarship you can rely on to illuminate the content of military necessity as it appears as an exception in positive IHL. Where, again, as I said, where military necessity exceptions do not appear, speaking about military necessity doesn't get you anywhere because it's been accounted for and excluded by the lawmakers. That's what happens in the normative context of IHL lawmaking. Thank you so much for, for your, your answers. Uh, I think uh, this should come to an end uh, in view of the, of the time limit that we have ahead of us. Um, thank you everyone for your great engagement. I see that there has been, that all, all IHL nerds have been connected throughout the, throughout the, the discussion. So, so that's, uh, that's really great. Thank you for your excellent questions. Uh, if you still have some questions that are left unanswered, first of all, uh, my apologies, but you can uh, still send it to uh, the email address that will appear now in the chat, conferencemanager at acer.nl. Uh, and we will forward them to, to Nobuo. And Nobuo, thank you very much for your great presentation, for your elaborate answers. Um, I think it was very clear and, and very thought provoking. Uh, so all, uh, on behalf of all the, the organizing institutions, I would like to thank everybody for, for coming virtually to the ASER Institute, uh, but in particular uh, to, to thank you Nobuo. Uh, please join me virtually uh, in, in thanking him. More, more lectures will be organized soon by the ASER Institute in the coming weeks. You can uh, find them on, the, on, on our website or uh, even signing up uh, to our mailing list. But just two of them that I would like to share with you. We have another HILAC event on November 3rd on IHL and non-state actors. And then on, our, uh, on the 26th of November, we have our annual lecture with Professor Andrew Murray on law and human agency in the time of artificial intelligence. So uh, I'm looking forward to seeing you all there. Have a great...